hi everyone. My name is Karen Ronning Hall and I am your neighborhood uh, preparedness evangelist. Tonight we'll be talking about barrels, how to create community caches and rain barrel storage using barrels uh, for neighborhood storage and water collection. So this program is uh, brought to you by Cedar Hills Ready and Quake Up. Our mission is to create caring, connected, and resilient neighborhoods. We are committed to making sure that every neighbor is prepared and has the best chance of survival in the event of a disaster. Here is our agenda. Our theme today is focused on water resiliency in a disaster and how barrels can factor into your preparedness strategy. We'll talk a few minutes about the importance of water, sanitation, and hygiene and why planning for this critically important in your survival for a disaster. So after a quick review of WASH, three of our neighbors will be sharing examples of how they are making sure that their family and their communities have the supplies, tools, and know-how for ensuring their water sources will be available and clean during a disaster. So what's WASH? And why is it so important? Very briefly, we mostly take our water for granted in this country, but in many areas of the world, they just don't have working toilets and faucets. The CDC and the World Health Organization have created a structure for talking about the necessity of plentiful water for good health, particularly for helping poor areas in the world. But we, are also experiencing this kind of water insecurity too, especially during a disaster or an emergency. The CDC and whose structure, they call this WASH for water, sanitation, and hygiene. And believe me, it's all about water. Water is critically important for everyone's survival. Sanitation and hygiene is important for keeping us clean and preventing diseases. And if you want more details about our WASH program, and how you can prepare, um, watch that recording, as I mentioned earlier, of our February program. It's on our website and YouTube channel, which are on this screen. Well, um, in this country, access to clean water is normally readily available. During a disaster, this just isn't so. Can you think of a recent example of a water crisis in the US? If you thought of Texas in February 2021 this year, five months ago, you were right. The state of Texas lost power due to a frigid winter storm. The pipes froze, many broke, sanitation plants went offline. Imagine that, the sanitation plants went offline. That, was, that left millions of people without drinkable water for weeks, even after the storm had passed and the power was restored. We never imagined a day where hospitals wouldn't have water, said the director of Austin Water, Greg Mazaros. Think about that. More of these severe weather storms are happening, so it's important to plan ahead and make sure you have the supplies you need and the know-how to secure clean water, sanitation, and hygiene during an emergency or disaster. Some creative and dedicated folks here in Beaverton are doing just that, and we're gonna learn from them tonight. So what you're gonna to learn tonight, we'll start with a short video starring Judy Janowitz and how she used barrels to build community caches, organizing 230 homes in a neighborhood. Special thanks to Doug Knight, a fellow CERT member and amateur radio and resiliency volunteer. He worked with Judy to create this video for your benefit. Then Lincoln Thomas will talk to us about how to use barrels to collect and store rainwater. He's done this at his home in Cedar Hills. It's nice to have an expert next door. And finally, Stan Hausman will talk to us about a method of pre-filtering water before you drink it, because water collected from outdoors can be pretty darn gross otherwise, and also dangerous. And now a video from J Judy Janowitz and Doug Knight. Hi, 
Thanks for joining us this evening. Here on the West Coast, everyone should have a plan to take care of themselves and their needs in the event of an earthquake. There are a lot of online resources for food and water that we can check and other materials that everyone should have set aside in the event of an emergency. However, we know that some people will be unprepared and some of what we set aside may be damaged or destroyed in a disaster. So to help fill this gap, your neighborhood homeowners association or apartment complexes or even you should get together and organize stashes of community supplies to help neighborhoods get through the first few days after a disaster. A few years ago, our North Beaverton neighborhood got together and decided to donate some funds and create some caches for our homes. We have 230 homes and we figured we needed about 13 barrels set up with water kits for filtration, um, bathroom kits, and also hand washing kits. And we were able to do this by getting the donations, setting up the supplies, and making it into a three-year project. We decided in the first year that we would do the wash or the water sanitation and, and uh, hygiene kits. The second year we would do medical supplies, things that you typically don't keep in your home like splints or burn gels. In the third year we wanted to do some tools to help with light search and rescue. Also things that you don't typically keep in your house like come-alongs and, and firemen's axes, that sort of thing. So the problem that occurred immediately was how do we store all of these? And after a lot of discussion and a lot of meetings, it was decided to use uh, sorry, 55 gallon plastic drums. And these came with a lid, they were securely attached, uh, they were waterproof and critter proof. So we reached out to a winery in Dundee and were able to purchase some used ones that had been sanitized and had those for our use. And these are the perfect size for what we needed. And we wanted to be sure they were secure. And because the bands went around the top and were able to be locked with a tiny padlock or with a zip tie, uh, we were able to determine if somebody uh, was actually ever got into them. And so far we've had five years and no problems at all. And so let's talk a little bit about what we actually put into our barrels for our water filtration kit. When you go to your pond or your nearest lake or river to get water, you'll bring it in a clean food quality bucket and it will be poured into the top of your filtration water kit. In this kit we have a filter it is dome shaped. The filter is about a gallon of water per hour. And in our particular barrels, we have two kits set up. Once it filters through, we have a little faucet here where we can make easy access to getting water when we need it. So to disassemble or put things together, we simply stack all these buckets one inside the other and they easily fit then into our barrel. And our second items that we're going to be talking about is our sanitation kit or bathroom kit. And we have organized this so that it can also be very compact and put into our barrels. And one of the first things we purchased for our sanitation kit were these anywhere toilet kits because there's going to be a kit or someone after disaster that really has to go right away. And this has a liner for either your current toilet and if the sanitation isn't working you've got a liner here that will uh, be useful for a day or two until you can get something more permanent set up. When setting up these kits, you'll want to at line them with a compactor bag. And that's because they are thicker than the regular garbage sacks and you'll need to store them later for a city pickup. Now, the system we use is called the New Zealand system they use during their earthquake. And it's a two bucket system with pee and poo and carbon. The carbon material we selected here are some heavy uh, pellets wood pellets. Uh, you could also use sawdust, leaves, anything that's carbon to cover up the poo so that you can keep out the flies and other things that might cause uh, diseases to be spread. We also have professional rolls of toilet paper. These you notice are coreless so they're very dense and compact which makes it easier to store them in our barrels. And we have gloves for handling this as well. And so the third kit we have is one for hand washing. We want to use as little water as possible. So the clean water is put here into this gallon jug. It has a hole on the bottom and it can be tipped or tilted 
by stepping on this little board here at the foot. You step on the board, it tilts, you wash your hands, you have paper towels to dry or soap to wash with. And I have to tell you, you really should not use regular towels for this operation. Either air dry or use something that's disposable. Hi right, folks, we have four more items we want to mention to you that we put into our barrels. One is this First Alert drinking water test kit. It has some strips so we can check the water before we actually put it into our filtration system to be sure it's clear and clean, uh, not containing contaminants that might be coming from upstream or from a pond where you got your water source. So folks, we also have this portable aqua tablets that are similar to bleach and they can help clarify the water so that you're sure that it's safe to drink uh, in just 35 minutes. And one thing that a lot of us love is this 4-in-1 tool. It is uh, spark resistant. It can be used to turn off your water. It can be used to turn off your gas or to uh, break out a window uh, to pry open a door. It's just great to have in your tool kit. And finally, this became an extra for us because we had a little funds left over. So every one of our barrels now has a privacy tent in it. This is a little bit like the shower tents you see campers using. And that's so that our pee and poo buckets and so forth can be set up private outside of a home. So that several people have access to it rather than having to go into someone's abode. So you might be wondering about the cost of this to the families and to the neighborhood. We were able to collect enough for each barrel, which ran between $300 and $350. And for 15 to 20 families, that came out between 15 to $25 per family, which really is pretty cheap insurance. We put one barrel in each section of our neighborhood of about 15 to 20 homes. And the neighbors uh, who hosted the barrels then sent out a little uh, letter to everyone to let them know where the barrel was located and to give them access to it. And only the neighbors in their actual little section know where the barrel is located. We also want to let you know that there's other ways to prepare by joining the uh, CERT program. CERT stands for the Community Emergency Response Team, and all the people living in the Beaverton School District are able to take classes free at the Beaverton City Emergency Center in either, uh, usually they're offered in April or in September, to uh, learn how to do uh, triage, uh, search and rescue, uh, suppress small fires, and that sort of thing. So the more certs we have around, the better we are prepared. On the Cedar Hills Ready website, we will post uh, another copy of this video in a few days. And we'll also have a list of other resources in case you want to know what is in the kits for the water filtration or the bathroom kits and so forth. And of course, coming up uh, on the same program, we're going to have a rain barrel collection demo, and that will be posted at the same time. Thank you for your attention, and we hope you'll get ready and get to work. Wow, what an awesome video presentation. Thank you, Judy. Um, you'll find a complete list of all the contents of these community wash barrels on our website, and the URL is right there on the screen uh, in the left lower corner. You may remember Lincoln from our last meeting. He's the Cedar Hills Ready Neighborhood Coordinator and Newsletter Editor, and also the web manager for our local gardening group called the Cedar Hills Backyard Farmers Market. Lincoln has a degree in civil engineering and, uh, and five rain barrels in his backyard. And today he's going to talk to us about residential rainwater harvesting. Lincoln? Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> so why is it a good idea to harvest rain? Well, as we've discussed today and in past meetings, a Cascadia earthquake event could halt municipal water service. So you'll want to store at least one gallon of water, drinking water per person per day for two or more weeks. But since Oregonians use closer to 100 gallons of water each day for things like irrigation, bathing, washing dishes, washing clothes, a rain barrel could provide a source of supplementary water, even if it's not safe to ingest without proper treatment. We will discuss potential treatment later on. Aside from earthquakes, Cedar Hills provider, Tualatin Valley Water District, cites that water curtailment can occur for other reasons like drought, source contamination, and power outages. 
OPB also recently reported on a statewide chlorine shortage causing Lake Oswego and Tigard to direct residents to reduce water usage. Uh, so since we're in a drought now and they're expected to include increase with climate change, here's some context. As of June 19th, this June 19th, a few days ago, 99% of Oregon is in a moderate drought and 77% of Oregon is under severe drought, which includes the Portland metro area. This is because in March, April, and May of this year, uh, we had about two inches less of rain precipitation than average for our region. So we're about, or more than six inches behind average at this point. <clears throat> the Tuolumne Valley Water District Curtailment Plan includes four stages, and they routinely implement stage one summer advisory every year due to our, uh, our current drought and dry long-term regional forecast, advancing past stage one would seem likely for this year. Aside, for disa aside from disaster water supplies, collecting and using rainwater in the landscape has other benefits. First, it conserves municipal drinking water. Second, it allows rainwater to infiltrate and be stored in the ground instead of flowing more quickly to storm sewers and rivers. So on a very small scale, collecting and infiltrating water from your roof reduces flooding. For folks in Portland, reducing stormwater runoff can improve sanitation because stormwater and wastewater are combined in their system and occasionally overwhelmed by heavy rains. Storing rain in barrels and in the landscape helps prevent events where the Willamette River becomes contaminated. So <clears throat> you might be asking whether it's legal and uh, the answer is yes. While restrictions can vary by state and county, Oregon actually encourages residents to harvest rainwater and we've provided links on our website to a few states and county resources on rainwater collection. Well, if you're living in Cedar Hills, you might be asking what the HOA of Cedar Hills says about it. Uh, the answer is nothing specifically. Like any other project, if it is in a front yard uh, or within setbacks of a property line, you'll likely need approval. There are currently a few attractive front yard rain barrels in Cedar Hills. Before you start your rain barrel project, you might want to test it for potential hazards, according to various uses. Though Oregon rain is usually very clean as it's falling, it picks up contaminants as it flows down a roof, down gutters, uh, down downspouts, and into storage. Therefore, it is never safe to drink untreated water straight from a rain barrel. The concentration of these contaminants will typically decrease as rain falls and the system is cleansed. For instance, June 13th saw about three quarters of an inch of rain. And if captured from a roof, the later portion of this rain could potentially be made safe to drink depending on the system. The Texas Manual on Rainwater Harvesting, the third edition uh, in 2005 indicates that asphalt shingle roofs leach toxins. So asphalt shingles aren't, are not typically recommended as a catchment surface for potable water systems. If you'd like to explore using a roof for a potable rainwater system, a first step might be to collect some water from your downspout or gutters during your rain and have it professionally tested. We've, um, we've provided a link to the OHAs, the Oregon Health Authority's list of certified water testing labs on this slide. Or you could buy a water testing kit and do it yourself. While we don't endorse any particular brand, the one duty mentioned in the video earlier is the first alert drinking water test kit. If you're interested in rain barrels to irrigate edible plants, then according to OSU, uh, a publication from them, on rainwater use in the garden, asphalt shingles are all right, but shingles made from wood, tar, gravel, or concrete should be avoided. Metal roofs may be the best roofing material for harvested uh, rainwater applications. So now that you're all convinced to bail the rain barrel in your, in your yard, you probably want to know how big it should be. So here's a simple and approximate calculated answer with a few givens. First of all, the average annual rainfall for Portland is over 35 inches. Uh, the, and due to initial absorption into roof shingles, evaporation, system leaks, et cetera, only about 75% of this can be captured. This translates to about half a gallon captured per square foot of roof per inch of rainfall. <clears throat> So the roof area of, of my house, of our house, is 1,800 square feet, about, which is smaller than average. 
but let's round that down to a thousand square feet just to make the math easier. So in one year we would expect, based on this, we would have, expect to have 17,500 gallons available, available to capture based on the amount of rainfall and how much air we have. Now, that is a lot to store, but consider two things. It's still less than what the average Oregonian uses in a year. Even if, and even if you wanted to disconnect from municipal water sources, you wouldn't need to store this much at once. For my household, at least, we're interested in supplementing our storage enough for a disaster if it were to occur at the beginning of Portland's dry season and we didn't have any municipal water flowing to us. So I won't bore you with additional calculations for individual monthly precipitation and collection, but you have that data available to you right here. Isn't it beautiful? <clears throat> uh, this chart came from the Wikipedia page on Portland in the climate section, if you want to browse it later or just come back to the slide. Okay, so let's talk about the components of a rain barrel system. First, the catchment surface or roof. Second, the conveyance, which um, consists of the gutters, downspout, and diverter. Uh, third, a filtration system. Fourth, a storage system. And lastly, the overflow system for when the barrel is full. <clears throat> First, how does one measure a roof uh, or the area of the roof? Well, one way of measuring it is by um, measuring the length of the perimeter of a section in Google Maps, which is what I've done here is on the slide. So I just um, clicked around, you left click, and then you can scroll down to find the measure, um, I, uh, the measure section in that when you, when you do that. And then you click around the section. And so that's one section of my roof. <clears throat> and then once you complete the perimeter, an approximate area of the section will be displayed as you see on the slide. If a roof catches too much of rain at one time, the conveyance system can overflow. Uh, to avoid overflowing, OSU's Rain Harvesting Guide advises that downspouts be sized at one square inch per 100 square feet of roof area. So a standard two by three inch downspout is enough for a 600 square foot roof section. As I recently learned, our existing downspout is not adequate for this 750 square foot section of my roof. And most Cedar Hills homes actually have a downspout that is actually smaller than the two by three standard. Uh, so it's possible that one of your downspouts is undersized and just like mine. There might be something you want to adjust if you're looking into this. So let's move on to conveyance. With or without a rain barrel, your gutters and downspouts need to be relatively free from debris to work properly. Larger downspouts should clog less frequently, but all may need inspection and maintenance at least once a year. In this slide, the downspout flows straight into a rain barrel. If you were to choose this layout, you'd want to include a screen on top of the barrel that keeps debris and mosquitoes out. You can also leave a standard downspout in place and connect a diverter to it to convey water to a barrel or another, or another tank. Downspout diverters can attach to an existing downspout in a variety of ways. Some involve cutting all the way through the downspout. Others involve cutting a hole in the side of the downspout and with a hole saw that connects to an electric drill. Diverters are designed to catch the water that tends to flow along the inner walls of a downspout while some any debris that might be falling falls through the middle. Uh, but if debris is flowing through the downspout, adding a diverter will increase the chance that the, the debris can form a clog. And so if debris falls on your roof, you may want to consider a, some kind of filter above the diverter, which is collecting the water, or some kind of leaf strainer at the top of the downspout. So I've just mentioned two types of filters to consider in use for the downspout diverter. Here are some examples of what I'm calling a pre-downspout and a post-downspout filters. A pre-downspout strainer is designed to trap debris in the gutter and still allow water to access the downspout. Consequently, it needs more cleaning out, depending on how much debris is falling on your roof. Other longer designs, uh, longer in length, might, so longer in length than the strainer right there in the gutter, they might last longer before becoming clogged, but this is a very standard uh, leaf strainer. A post downspout filter, which could be installed right above a diverter and right above a rain barrel, might be a preferred option for me, 
because it should allow more of the debris to exit the gutter and the downspouts, and I wouldn't need to clean it out so much. Though, if a lot of debris is washing off of the filter that's right above the, the rain barrel, then the manner in which it collects on the ground may require some consideration and planning. Another option is a first flush diverter, which is meant to capture as much of the initial rainwater and debris as possible, separately from what is collected in a rain barrel. As I described earlier, this initial flush is the dirtiest water. Think of airborne pollution and dirt and bird poop and other leaves and any initial leaching that might be happening from roof shingles. Once this diverter is filled up, um, the remaining cleaner water proceeds to a rain barrel for storage. The first flush diverter empties slowly so that it is ready to catch another first flush in the next rain event in a day or so. Though a roof would likely need more than a day to get very dirty again. If large debris hasn't been filtered out of the first flush diverter, then it may need to be removed via the cleanout plug, which is the bottom section of that right image um, on the screen. An alternative to the first flush diverter is to manually switch collection on following the first cleansing rain of the season. Some diverters like this one make the switching a little bit easier. We just flick a switch and the rain goes somewhere else. It goes in the rain barrel in one section or it goes um, down and maybe in another direction if you flip the switch. Some diverters like mine have a replaceable winter, cap, uh, winter season cap for when the owner wants to pause rain collection. Notice the cap um, stored on the wall in the left image. And also take a second to enjoy the elegant engineering of this diverter that squeezes, that's able to squeeze through a hole in downspouts and then unsqueeze and then fit the downspout so nicely that it collects water and allows debris to continue to fall through that hole in the middle. All right, let's move on to storage options. A 55 gallon rain barrel is the standard, though other sizes and styles and prices are available. I purchased most of my barrels clean and like new on Craigslist for $20 each. If you were to go this route, you'll want to make sure that the barrels are completely clean and made of food grade plastic. And opaque or non-translucent barrels are better because they prevent algae from growing on the inside. All right, let's consider where we could keep a rain barrel. Well, near a downspout is going to be easiest if that's where you're getting your, your rainwater. And if you could place it near a garden and you want to use it for the garden, that's logical. Um, also, out of direct sunlight should improve the longevity of any plastic components that you're using. Uh, and also, raising the barrel higher off of the ground means that there's gonna be more gravitational potential energy to drive water through a hose, which um, that energy could help if the garden is not nearby. But making sure a higher setup is seismically secure could be more difficult. Simply stacking multiple courses of concrete blocks will not be secure. And if this is to be an after earthquake resource for you, then you'll need a stable foundation and proper anchoring so that it won't fall over or damage a wall when, if there's an earthquake. The strapping in this picture is okay, but it could still be a bit more secure so that the barrels don't fall sideways from where they're anchored. All right, let's now talk about overflow systems. For when the barrel is almost full, you want an outlet to be located lower than the inlet to ensure that the excess water can drain easily. The outlet water can go to another barrel or container. It can go to a rain garden and OSU and Portland have resources for building either of those or for building that. Uh, or it can go to this back to the streets and many homes already have this set up via underground drainage pipes and many diverters automatically send overflow water back through the same downspout. So that would only be one hole instead of an inlet and an outlet. All right, now let's talk about seasonal maintenance on a rain barrel. This um, will depend on the setup, but common guidelines include draining and cleaning the barrel annually. 
This might be most practical anytime you expect seasonal rainfall to easily be able to refill the barrels after you clean them. Common guidelines also say to empty rain barrels in the winter to avoid the chance that freezing water could crack the barrel or crack um, any of the components that are connecting the barrels together. This is probably wise, though I have tested whether partially full barrels would crack during the last two winters. And as long as there is sufficient expansion space for a layer of ice to rise on the top, it seems unlikely that our climate would get cold enough for long enough to freeze enough of the barrel to crack it. And if a disaster strikes, I would like my barrels to be at least partially full and usable as a water source. So to summarize, I gave a very quick overview of how and why to harvest and use rainwater from your roof. While untreated water is not safe to ingest, it may, um, it has many other uses and it may be possible that the water could be made safe with proper filtration and treatment. We discussed rain collection components and finished with a discussion of regular maintenance. There is much more the material than I can cover in tonight's presentation. So we have linked to three local rainwater harvesting guides on our website and I'll be available to answer questions in the Q&A. Thank you, everyone. I'll now turn the program back over to Karen to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Lincoln. That was informative. Every time I look at this material, I learn something new. Our next speaker, Stan Hausman, is the founder of Quake Up Northwest and the master of disaster. He's going to talk about how to make clean drinking water for the entire family. In other words, how to purify mucky water. Stan? Thank you, Karen. Um, welcome, everybody. I appreciate you all being here. So what we think about is water, water everywhere. About 70% of our planet Earth is covered in it. Yet our drinkable water sources are less than 1% of the fresh water which is accessible to us. If after a disaster, you have used all of your stored water and there are no other reliable clean water sources, it may become necessary to treat suspicious water. What are your closest outside sources of water? Take a minute to think about where you would find water in your area in the event of a disaster. Possible sources of water that could be made safe by treatment include rainwater, streams, rivers, and other moving bodies of water, ponds and lakes, natural springs. Um, the last two, the well and tap water may not be reliable after an earthquake. As an example of two sources in the Cedar Hills area is Commonwealth Lake and Johnson Creek. The downside of living in the urban areas is the potential that water sources are very likely to be polluted as rainfall carries road salts, oil, grease, and chemicals from vehicle emissions, pet and animal waste, and debris from asphalt, concrete, stone, brick, roofing, etc., which all end up in these waterways. Besides these, scientists are finding that they are contaminated with traces of medications, antibacterial chemicals, pesticides, and other chemicals that are linked to harmful health conditions. If you suspect or know the water is contaminated, it cannot be made safe and you should not drink or come in contact with this water. So for added emphasis, do not go into or come in contact with water that smells bad, looks discolored, has foam, scum, algal mats, or paint-like streaks on the surface, has dead fish or other animals washed up on its shore or beach. I cannot emphasize this enough. If you suspect or know the water is contaminated with toxic chemicals or fuels, has an unusual odor or color, it cannot be made safe. So a different source of water needs to be found. For water treatment, Treat all water of uncertain quality before using it for drinking, food washing or preparation, washing dishes, brushing teeth, etc. There are many ways to treat water. The best solution is a combination of methods. Before treating, let any suspended particles settle to the bottom or strain them through coffee filters or layers of clean cloth. 
Next slide. <clears throat> Another thing to, to know is water from sources outside the home must be treated to kill harmful germs, which include microscopic bacteria, viruses, fungi, and protozoa that can cause disease. Here are the top four waterborne pathogens. Norovirus is a very contagious virus. Giardia is from feces, or let's say poop. Cryptosporidium is a microscopic parasite. And then there's Campylobacter, causes an infection by drinking untreated water. Also, as we have seen over the past years in summer, cyanotoxin, algae blooms. These algae blooms can produce toxins that make people and animals sick. Now adding insult to injury, if you get sick, you'll need to drink even more water, which is not at all good when you're already dealing with a water crisis and access to clean water is limited. So cleaning water is important. The signs and symptoms of ailments typically occur within 10 days of infection, which may include stomach pain, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, dehydration, weight loss, liver damage, headache, neurological symptoms of muscular weakness and dizziness. <clears throat> For water that can be made safe, there are three recommended options. The best solution is a combination of methods. Boiling. If water is cloudy, allow it to settle. Then skim the clean water above the sediment. You can also filter through clean cloth, paper towel, or coffee filter before boiling. Boil for one minute. At high elevations above 6,500 feet, boil for three minutes. Store the boiled water in clean, sanitized containers with tight covers. Disinfect with unscented household chlorine bleach or iodine, which is useful against most, but not all harmful viruses or bacteria. Add eight drops or a little less than an eighth of a teaspoon of five to 9% household bleach to a gallon of water. This is most common in the US, though it could be as low as 1%. Ensure you use the proper concentration. Then there's chlorine dioxide tablets, which is useful against germs resistant to bleach or iodine. And last is filtering. Filter water through a clean cloth, paper towel, or coffee filter, or allow it to settle. Then draw off the clear water. Use a portable water filter. Recognize though that not all portable water filters remove bacteria or viruses. It's best to choose a water filter labeled to remove germs, which is indicated by the filter's pore size and is small enough to remove bacteria and parasites. Please follow the manufacturer's instructions. After filtering, you need to add a disinfectant such as iodine, chlorine, and or chlorine dioxide to the filter water to kill any viruses and remaining bacteria. Next slide. Notice a theme here. Let any suspended particles settle to the bottom or strain them. If water is cloudy, allow it to settle. Filter water through a clean cloth, paper towel or coffee filter, or allow it to settle. This is why. A ceramic water filter and a two bucket water filter system will do the job and with clean enough water will work well. But with dirty, turbid water, they will fail. However, because they will quickly become clogged from the dirt and mud. So how to pre-treat turbid water so that whatever secondary treatment system you choose will work long and effectively. There are numerous ways and means to settle dirty turbid water. Cloth filtration, container covered with multiple layers of cloth. Sand and gravel filtration. Container has a spigot at the bottom. Settling and decanting. Container of water sits for two to 24 hours so that the particulate settle to the bottom before decanting by pouring it into another container, leaving the solids to be safely disposed of by 
Solids stick together from stirring in chemicals or natural occurring substances. This is coagulation and flocculation, which I'll explain later. What happens is water will settle within 20 minutes to several hours, followed by enhanced pretreatment filtration and capillary siphon process like osmosis. Alternatively, PNG purifier of water packets simplify the process. There are other types and methods. We're going to see this one demonstrated. This is an example of what's available. We are not endorsing any particular brands or products. There are a number of steps in treating water. Before you begin, collect the water, then screen and straight out the debris. The next five steps are pour in chemical contents, stir for sediment to begin to clump together. This is coagulation and gradually increases the uh, amount. Flocculation is the next step. Settle the sediment, wait for clarification, filter to separate the clear liquid, purified water after disinfection time period. What does Procter & Gamble purifier of water do? The water purifier, no, I'm sorry. The water purification technology was developed in collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, commonly known as the CDC. This packet contains powdered ferric sulfate, which causes the solids to clump and settle, and calcium hypochlorite, which disinfects germs. It's been proven to vastly reduce bacteria, viruses, and protozoa in water, removes heavy metals and chemicals, increases free chlorine protection against contamination, reduction of diarrhea disease, makes clean drinking water for the entire family, including infants. And the World Health Organization classifies the technology as providing comprehensive protection. So how does the PNG water pur purification packets work? Here is a YouTube demonstration. Unfortunately, there's no sound in this, so I will kind of talk us through it. This is Dr. Greg Allgood from PNG, who will demonstrate the PURE, P-U-R, which is now called Purify of Water. Note the timer in the upper left corner. Remember the five steps? Pour, open the packet and add the contents to an open bucket containing 10 liters, about two and a half gallons of water. Stir for five minutes. Settle. This allows the solids to settle to the bottom of the bucket, which takes another five minutes. Isn't that cool? Yep. Filter, strain the water through a cotton cloth into a second container. Notice he doesn't pour the solids on, into it. He, just, he stops just short of that. Purified water. This will take 20 minutes for the hypochlorite to disinfect the germs. So here we are at 32 minutes. He removes the cloth. And then Dr. Greg Allgood drinks it. So remember where it, st where it started. As a final note, we're pre-filtering dirty water and this is from the makers of Outback Water Purification System. Using the clearest possible water source, a settling bucket, and keeping the pre-filter sleeve and filter clean, 
is helpful in prolonging the useful life of the filters. So how did this become a focal point? I read about needing to be careful when handling the ceramic filter and that it would need to be cleaned as it could uh, get dirty through, uh, become clogged with dirt and mud. I think when we are at a disaster of the magnitude and the extremes we will be in by planning ahead and reducing negative impacts where you can makes getting through a disaster a bit easier. Don't you think so too? Also, I like to minimize efforts when I can and look for ways to extend the useful life of the ceramic filter in the two bucket water filter system. After discovering that pre-filtering dirty water, which minimizes the filter clogging up and thus lessen the need to be cleaned frequently with more clean water. As I mentioned before, there are a number of methods to achieve this. Cloth, sand and gravel, settling and decanting, etc. Most important is the value of having peace of mind. By first taking the extra steps to pre-filter dirty water and then filtering a second time with the two bucket water filter system, that gives me a comforting feeling. I hope this helps. That's all I have. Back to you, Karen, and thank you. Thank you, Stan, that was great. All right, thank you. Um, thanks to Stan and all of our speakers tonight. Uh, our neighbors and friends have provided great examples and information about how to become more resilient. And here's what you learned tonight from our speakers. Judy showed us how to build community caches for wash supplies. And, and Lincoln talked about how to create a barrel system to harvest rain for our emergency water supplies and gardens. And Stan Hausman showed us an innovative way to purify water. Having a plan and supplies in place for water, sanitation and hygiene is critical to your survival in an emergency or disaster. I've learned a lot. Um, how about you? And what is your next step? It's all about actually taking action. Learning about all this stuff is great, but you've got to take an action, even a small step towards protecting yourself and your family. So take a moment to figure out what your next step in your resiliency journey is going to be. Give yourself a deadline in a couple of weeks. I'd love to hear back from you. And we'll uh, give you like a half a minute here to type your next step into your chat, into the chat box or put it on your calendar. Bill, so uh, you wanna start off with the questions and the answers? Let me stop sharing this so we can see people's faces. Nice to see everybody's face. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm gonna start off, uh, I'm gonna uh, do this by in order of uh, speaker and topic. Uh, Mandy asked, how do I subscribe to the newsletter? Um, you are subscribed if you have, uh, if you are in this meeting, <laughs> your name will be in there. So you'll get it right away. Well, allow for a few um, days. We usually, I mean, Lincoln, you're the one that, that produces it. It usually goes out in the first of the month or so, uh, first week or two. Uh, uh, okay, uh, for, uh, for Judy, um, Angela asked, where can I get, uh, where can I purchase a barrel with the kinds of lid that you were talking about? Well, several years ago, we got ours from a winery in Dundee, uh, but I do know they're available on Craigslist. I think some people have actually made a business of collecting the used barrels and cleaning them up. So I would go to Craigslist. You can buy them new, but they're, they're around $60, uh, fairly expensive new. Uh, and also, uh, Cindy asked, uh, are there enough supplies uh, in these barrels for a bunch of families, uh, for example, sanitation kits for each home. Yes, we have what, what we're military calls the wag bags for the first week that kind of takes over for, for the first little bit. Actually having those two uh, pee and poo setups, um, we encourage people to have their own in their own home because having 15 families share, you'll be 
uh, emptying those buckets fairly often. All right. Um, now I've got uh, I got some questions actually before we started. Uh, Alyssa asked. Uh, she's wanted a rain barrel for years, but they look so expensive. Uh, uh, does uh, Lincoln have uh, any sources or resources that you can provide uh, to get them more cheaply? Well, so I said I got mine on Craigslist for twenty dollars, um, and that that person I got them from on Craigslist is still um, he works for somewhere downtown, and he cleans them out from his business and then he sells them. Um, so yeah, that's still on Craigslist and the parts that I got my, that I used for my rain barrel are, um, the Earthwise, I think, rain barrel, um, kit. You can get that from rainbrothers.com and there's other, other diverters you can buy, but that's the one I went with, I went with. Okay. I'll um, try to find a link and put it in the chat. Okay. Uh, uh... Vicki asked, uh, we'd like to hear about sanitation in relation to earthquakes. Uh, the, uh, the, the point of this one is that the Nextdoor app would not let her register. She had to go to our Facebook page in order to register. So that's just a note, Karen. Okay. Um, uh, and Laurel would like to know um, of the various things that we've presented tonight, um, how about purchasing some of these things pre-put together? <laughs> uh, the, the workshop that Karen talked about uh, will certainly give you uh, uh, a two-bucket a two uh, uh, water filtration system. What about, uh, what about the others? Anyone? Oh, I can uh, mention, go ahead, Karen. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to mention that REI sells the the Lugaloo set up the pee and poo stuff, uh, but it's much cheaper if you do it yourself. I I would also say that um, you know the the setup for the pee and poo is super easy. Uh, you can buy those um, buckets for you know I don't know I think they're like less than five dollars at um, at Home Depot or. Um, one of those kind of stores. And then the, the top, the little, the little uh, toilet top, like lug, is it lug -lulu? I just got mine off of Amazon. I just ordered it and it came to my door. <laughs> so super easy. And it was not expensive. It was like maybe $12 or something back then. It was a while ago. So I don't know what they cost right now, but, um, but they're, they're pretty, they're, they're pretty easy to get a hold of. Um, and then the filter system, the filter, the two bucket filter system, as as I said, if you're interested in that, we're looking at the um, at doing that workshop, and we can sell you uh, the filter part uh, and the instructions for how to create your own um, uh, at cost. And I, what did we, what did we figure out what the cost was? I think it was thirty dollars. Was thirty dollars? Yeah, yeah, and you, can, I mean, you can get them on. On Amazon for thirty dollars, uh, and and we'll sell them for the same. That's what we got them for. Without any other questions, Phil, that are, you have written nope, down. that pretty much covers it. Any other uh, questions that uh, people have suddenly uh, come up with? Stan, did you have an answer for somebody? Yes, uh, uh, I mentioned the company Outback Water Purification System, and it. It costs uh, over a hundred dollars for something similar to the two bucket system, but it's all put together and comes to your door, you know, all, all ready to go. And there are a number of businesses that make up these things and uh, for added cost, but I mean, they're all done. I mean, you don't have to do anything. They're, they're all put together. Uh, they're similarly designed uh, but, um, and then they, and then like for water filtration, uh, these can be very exotic, uh, from, uh, a couple of hundred dollars to over $500, depending on what their methodology and materials are and that type of thing. So, okay. Uh, and the one that, uh, that, uh, we showed the two bucket system 
do it yourself, uh, it is going to cost you around forty dollars, including right. everything. Exactly. So okay. something that we didn't mention tonight, and uh, I did, I mean, I think that we did mention it in the WASH um, presentation in February, but um, something I really encourage people in terms of water security to do is um, look online and get something like a life straw, uh, some kind of a purification that's going to go into your go bag. Um, because if you're on the road and <laughs> something happens, and you don't have water available, you're going to need some way to um, filter that. And I've seen, actually, these are really cool. There are some mugs that you can get, or not mugs, but water bottles that actually have purification system in the, in the water bottle. You just push the water through and it, and it purifies it. And it's, it's actually handy if you're on a hike um, with your dog, you know, you want to give them some water and you're ne next to some mucky water. So and you, can pick, you can pick these kinds of things up at, at uh, uh, any camping store and uh, many sporting goods stores. Yep. For coming, everybody. Yeah. If not, thank you yeah, very sure. much. Take that next step. Bye.